Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, proud citizens of vast early America, and publishers of the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. To learn more about the William & Mary Quarterly and how you can enjoy some of the best scholarship on the vast world of early American history, visit benfranklinsworld.com WMQ. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 132 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. When we explore early American history, we often look at people who lived in and the events that took place in North America. But European metropoles were central to the history of early America as early as 1492. So too were Native American peoples. So today, we're going to explore early American history through a slightly different lens. We're going to look at interactions between Native Americans and the people of London. Because you see, Interactions between Native Americans and Europeans didn't just take place in North America. They took place in London, too. Cole Thrush, an associate professor of history at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, and author of Indigenous London, Native Travelers at the Heart of the Empire, will serve as our guide for this exploration. And during this exploration, Cole reveals when and why Native Americans started to visit London how Londoners expected Native Americans to act, and what Native Americans thought of London and Londoners, and how Cull went about uncovering and recovering the voices of early American travelers to London. I think this is going to be a great adventure. So are you ready to voyage back in time and across the Atlantic? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of history at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. He's an expert in Indigenous history, and today he joins us to discuss details from his most recent book, Indigenous London, Native Travelers at the Heart of the Empire. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Call Thrush. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. And we're glad you could join us, Call, because your historical research offers such a fascinating viewpoint. When we think about Native American and European interactions, we tend to think of them as only taking place in North America. However, as Cole points out in his book, Indigenous London, there were many interactions that took place between Native Americans and Europeans in Europe. So Cole, would you tell us when and why Native Americans started visiting London? Well, the quick answer to that is earlier than you'd expect and for more reasons than you'd imagine. So going back to really as early as 1501 and 1502, there are indigenous presences in London. Three men who were probably Inuit were seen in Westminster Palace in those years, and that's only 10 years after Columbus. So this goes back earlier than really English colonialism in many ways. They came for a whole host of reasons. I think most people assume that they would have come primarily as captives, and that's true in the 16th and early 17th century, certainly. But by the 18th century, indigenous people from North America are coming as diplomatic delegates to London and to the crown. And by the 19th century, people are coming as performers as well as activists. So there's a real range of experiences that people have in the city. That really is much earlier than we'd expect, 1501 and 1502. So who were the travelers who went to London? Were most of them men or did women travel too? Overwhelmingly, we're talking about male travelers. There are some very well-known female exceptions to that, people like Pocahontas, for example, or an Ojibwe activist named Nani Bawigwe or Catherine Sutton, who comes in the 1860s. But by and large, these are mostly male expeditions. And what was it like for these early Native American travelers to make their way to London? What was their voyage like? Well, one of the interesting things about the sources is that we often don't have a lot about the voyage itself. We just have information about their time in London. But one of the things that really comes across with a lot of the visitors to London is a sense of being overwhelmed with the city, I would say, but not in a way that was any different from how Londoners themselves were overwhelmed with the city. The city itself is kind of the problem here. The city is this very chaotic, dirty, 
unequal kind of place, and Indigenous visitors really pick up on that very quickly, and that comes across. And I guess one of the things I really tried to highlight in the book is this idea of linked worlds, the idea of Indigenous worlds incorporating London and London incorporating Indigenous worlds at the same time. So I really talk a lot about the kind of mixing and hybridity of these spaces that Indigenous people are moving through. Now, in Indigenous London, you talk about three Native Americans who made some of the earliest voyages to London. And since you mentioned the fact that many Native peoples were overwhelmed by London, could you tell us more specifically what Manteo, Wanchese, and Pocahontas thought of London? And what roles Londoners expected them to play in London society? So Manteo and Wanchese, or Wanchese are both Roanoke men who were brought to London in the 1580s, and then Pocahontas came as part of a delegation in 1616. And we don't have a lot of information about them. There's a little bit more about Pocahontas, of course. But even in terms of her perceptions of the city, we have very little information about that at all. But in many cases, a lot of the indigenous people who were brought to London or who came to London, there was an expectation that they would become kind of helpmates to empire, that they would serve as translators, that they would serve as public relations objects for the Virginia Company, for example, and would help with kind of military and diplomatic relations in their home territories. In some cases, that happened. For example, Manteo, the Roanoke, he became kind of a translator and facilitator for the English. Wanchese, he became more of a resistor to the colonists from the sources that we have and may have even been responsible for the loss of the Roanoke colony or at least involved in that loss. And so there's a real diversity of outcomes in terms of what people did when they went back, as well as their perceptions of the city itself. Although, like I said, with these really early voyages, it's really hard to know what people thought of the city just because the sources are so fragmentary. It seems like the historical sources can't really tell us a lot about what early Native American travelers thought of London. But it does seem like they can tell us that going to London afforded these early travelers a chance to make their mark on history, especially if Juan Chase, as you say, contributed to the loss of the Roanoke colony. Yeah, they did. And then they also leave marks in other interesting ways. So, for example, a document that I worked with is a spelling system, an orthography that was created for the Roanoke language by a man named Thomas Harriet but it was actually co-authored. It was created by Manteo and Wanchese as well, and perhaps a third man named Tawaye. And there at the bottom of the orthography in this document that's at the Westminster School in London, there's a signature that says, King Manteo did this. And so here he's left literally his mark on this document, and it's the earliest example of alphabetic literacy north of Mexico. So this is really early stuff with indigenous people really engaging with systems of knowledge production and so on in places like London. Now, How did Londoners receive their Native American guests? Were they surprised by them? Did they treat them with respect due to emissaries from North America? How did they treat the Native Americans who visited them? Again, the answer is diversity. Overwhelmingly, the accounts of Indigenous visitors to London talk about massive crowds of people just following them around and trying to even break into their lodgings to look at them. And the sense of British fascination with the new and the novel and so on a lot of fascination with both the idea of the noble savage as well as just plain savage. And so sometimes you see incredibly racist poems and songs written about visitors. Other times, though, people who are abroad are seen very much as nobility. Sometimes the indigenous women who travel are compared favorably to British women because they're seen as more chaste and more upright and sort of proper than London women. So there's a real diversity of experience. But the key, I think, for me is that these people were not hidden at all. This is not a hidden history. These people were highly visible in their day. You mentioned the idea of the noble savage, and I wonder if you would tell us more about it, because it often appears in literature about Native Americans. So what is the idea of the noble savage and to what effect was it used? Well, the noble savage is the idea that somehow indigenous peoples have more freedoms and are perhaps more sort of healthy and more in tune with nature in a way that is positive and so on. And it's very flat in many ways, even though it's often a positive stereotype, it's a very flat one. And one of the key things for me thinking critically about the noble savage idea is that often noble savage imagery is discussed as though indigenous peoples don't really have any laws. They aren't encumbered by any sort of laws or by civilization and so on. And what that does is it really erases things like indigenous legal traditions, indigenous concepts of stewardship of land and all that. It it sort of turns them into just these noble wanderers in the landscape. But it's very, very powerful, I would say, for European audiences 
And often what it really is, though, is, is not very much about indigenous people. It's really about Europeans. It's Europeans using indigenous people as a mirror to look at themselves. And you really see that in these journeys to London. You see London audiences really talking as much about themselves as about indigenous people. And one of the things I really wanted to do with the book was try to push back against the kind of symbolic Indian, sort of the doomed noble savage or the vicious savage and so on, and talk about actual real indigenous lived experience in the city. Now, since we're talking about the ideas of the noble savage and the symbolic Indian, Jenny would like to know how Native Americans experienced and interacted with long distance travel. Specifically, she'd like to know whether Native Americans ever intentionally played into European expectations of them, such as the idea of the noble savage. And she'd also like to know whether Native Americans were able to create their own reputations so far from home. Yeah, absolutely. A great example of that is a man called Tyndanagea or Joseph Brandt, who made two trips to London in the late 18th century. And there's a great story of him being at a masked ball in London one evening, and the Turkish ambassador comes up to him and tries to remove his mask, but it's not a mask, it's his face, which is painted in the traditional way. And of course, this is seen as a major affront, and Brandt raises his tomahawk and lets out what is described as a war whoop, and the whole party stops. Everyone just sort of stops in their tracks, and then he just starts laughing. So it's clear he's playing up ideas about savagery and noble savagery and so on. And while he's in London, he is, you know, becoming a Freemason. He's engaged in archival research about his own people's history. He's definitely part of the Enlightenment. So he's absolutely engaged with these big threads of intellectual history and intellectual culture going on in London. But he's also actively playing with people's expectations of him. So to what ends did Joseph Brandt find it beneficial to play into Londoners' perceptions of him as a noble savage? Well, he's there as a military and diplomatic leader of the the Mohawk people and the Haudenosaunee more broadly. And I think it makes a lot of sense for him to try to gain purchase in the city using these kinds of ideas. And I think he's very savvy, as are a lot of the other travelers. They're very savvy, and they understand very quickly upon arrival, if not before, what it is that British audiences want. And so they're able to do that, whether that's someone like Samson Ockham, who's a Mohegan missionary who comes in the 1760s, and he's raising money for the institution that would eventually become Dartmouth. He knows exactly what his audiences want to see. They're very, very savvy performers and politicians. Now, in Indigenous London, you note that London had to learn how to become colonial. And I wonder if you would tell us what that meant. What did it mean for London to be the hub of the growing British Empire? And what role did Native American travelers play in helping London become colonial? One of the biggest issues, I would say, in the study of imperial history, one of the biggest debates that's been going on for a few years now is the extent to which everyday Londoners even really understood that they had an empire. And so one of the things I wanted to do was come into that discussion a bit and say, no, actually, the empire was there in the city in the form of these indigenous people from territories that were being claimed by Britain. And this continues throughout the book, really, into the 19th century, for example, when you have indigenous athletes being brought to the city. So Aboriginal Australian cricket players or Maori rugby players and so on. And they're actually literally competing against British bodies in spaces attended by thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And so the questions about the empire and about masculinity and power and all that kind of thing are being played out on the ground with indigenous people in the heart of the city. And so my opinion on the matter is that British people were very aware that they had an empire in these moments where they're engaging with indigenous visitors. And that's what I mean when I say London had to learn to be colonial and that indigenous people were at the center of that learning process. Many people view colonialism as a bad practice. And here you have these native travelers in London putting a very human face on the places where British people are establishing colonies and practicing colonialism. So did having these human faces of the colonies in London change any perceptions or convince any Londoners that they really should pursue their empire with a softened form of colonialism? That's a really great question. That's a really big question. It's hard to know what would have happened without these voyages. It's kind of a counterfactual history that is kind of hard to imagine, really. But I do think that there is a core question with the process of empire is how do we recognize humanity in the, quote, other? And you really see that in this story where you have indigenous people having very face-to-face human interactions with their hosts and with people they encounter in London. And then you have some very grim encounters where the pain and trauma of empire are very much on display. So, for example, 
One of the interludes in the book focuses on an Odawa boy who was brought to London as a war captive in the 1760s and was held in the home of a man who lived just down the street from Benjamin Franklin. And the boy would be brought out, he was about 11, he would be brought out as kind of entertainment for his host's guests and was shown boxes of scalps, some of which belonged to his kin and so on. So it's a very traumatic experience. And so that for me really captures the pain of empire at the same time that you have very wonderful sort of face-to-face conversations going on between people like Joseph Brandt and people who are interviewing him for the newspapers and so on. So it's, again, a real diversity of experience. But I also, in the book, really don't want to lose the sense of the trauma of colonialism. And as a follow-up question to that, you know in Indigenous London that to indigenize London is to begin to come to terms with the undeniably human costs of empire. Would you tell us what you mean by the human costs of empire? What were the human costs of the British Empire? So one of the things I try to do in the book is really emphasize indigenous agency to try to not portray indigenous people solely as victims of empire. But at the same time, and this is one of the real challenges with doing this kind of history, it's important to not underestimate or underplay the costs of empire because then colonialism doesn't sound so bad. And so what I'm trying to do is kind of oscillate between both those things, the trauma of empire as well as the survivance of indigenous peoples. And survivance is a term by the Ojibwe scholar Gerald Bisner, and it's more than just survival. It's about sort of creative resistance. And I'm trying to capture that as well. And what I've done with the book is create six interludes that are poetic interludes built out of archival fragments, and each one focuses on a different object in the city. And in those cases, what I've tried to do is really show, as in the case of that Odawa war captive, the 11-year-old, to really show, let's not forget what this is really about, that this is about power, this is about exploitation, this is about violence, and let's sort of have a drumbeat through the book that reminds us of that so we don't forget that. Now, to put more of a face on the peoples who visited London from the 1500s onward, I wonder if you would tell us about the Four Kings and about their experiences in the British metropole. The Four Kings were four men, three of them from the Mohawk Nation and one of them from the Allied Mohican Nation. And they came to London in 1710 to establish economic, military, religious, and kind of cultural alliances with the British crown. Queen Anne at the time. They had an audience with Queen Anne and the speech they gave to her was printed and reprinted and reprinted and circulated around the city. Poems were made about them. People passed around images of them around the city and so on. They were huge celebrities. And they were taken to you know, the theater, for example, and the audience kind of riots because they don't want to see the production. They want to see these men. And so chairs are put on the stage so the audience can watch them watching the play, for example. So there's this whole kind of culture of looking. And I really try to capture the idea of indigenous people looking back as well. And they're taken to virtually all the sites in the city that existed in 1710. They're taken to the Tower of London. They're taken to St. Paul's Cathedral. They're taken to the Pleasure Gardens and so on. So they're really at the center of British power in many ways. But there's a moment in which we can see how British attitudes about Indigenous people really come through. Two years after they leave in 1712, there's an outbreak of gang violence in the Covent Garden neighborhood of London. And one of the gangs that's most feared and that is most talked about calls themselves the Mohawks. And so you can get the sense of British ideas about so-called savagery and so on that's really being inflected by these visitations from Indigenous nations. We seem to have two ideas at play here. One is how English people perceived Native American people, and the second is how English people grappled with trying to form perceptions about Native American people. And since we've talked about the first, I wonder if you would help us explore the second idea. Would you give us a couple of examples of the type of art that Britons used to interact with Native people and their ideas about Native people? Well, there's some really well-known examples from Shakespeare, for example, The Tempest. You know, Caliban's character is generally understood to be a thinly veiled representation of an indigenous North American or American. But Native characters also show up in All's Well and Ends Well and Henry VIII, very brief mentions. And one of the things I try to do is get beyond just the pageants and the plays and so on and talk about how these things are really influenced by indigenous visitors to the city. Often these plays are written after indigenous travelers have come, and so they actually come first before the representations in many cases. And that's, again, that piece of London trying to learn to be colonial 
in the 19th century, Wordsworth writes a long poem that talks about kind of the panoply of diverse peoples in London, and he includes among them the, quote, hunter Indian from America. And so indigenous people are seen as part of just kind of the spectacle of London's diversity. And it's a way, again, for Londoners to kind of look back at themselves and understand what kind of city it is that they live in. What about religion? Did religion play any role in Native Americans' visits to London? I mean, like the Spanish and the French, the English certainly tried to convert Native Americans to Christianity. So were Native Americans who had converted to Christianity treated any differently or better than those who practice some form of Native religion? Absolutely. Christianity is central to the story. A good example of this is Pocahontas, who is you know, famously converted to Christianity, and the circumstances of her conversion are pretty hotly debated by scholars and descendants even today. But her presence in the city, the Virginia Company was not doing particularly well, and her presence as a Christian convert, as Lady Rebecca, was seen as a real coup for the Virginia Company and proof that colonization could be possible, that, quote, these people could be changed. And then again, in Samson Occam's case, the Mohegan minister's case in the 1760s, people are absolutely fascinated with this very erudite, powerful speaker, man who knows how to do politics and knows how to do legal activism and so on. People are quite taken with him in a sense that this man is as adept at doing these sorts of things as any of our people and in fact may actually be better at it. He may be a better minister because of his experience as a native person and as a convert than some of our kind of lapsed Christians here in London. And so Christianity really comes through in many of the cases. And many of the travelers had more engagement with Christianity than many of their peers in their own home nations because they were diplomats, because they were emissaries and so on. So Christianity is kind of a constant low rumble through the whole story in many ways. Now, just as the British Empire expanded, so too did London. Cole, would you tell us what Joseph Brandt and Samson Occam made of London? And how what they saw and experienced in the city shaped the ways they viewed the British Empire at the time of the American Revolution? Well, one of the things I try to talk about in a chapter that involves both Occam and Brandt is this idea of the city of reason that this is a city of the Enlightenment in the late 18th century, and you can see it in the architecture, this kind of rationalism and so on. But then I push back and say, but actually the city was completely chaotic and irrational in many ways as well. And many indigenous visitors, including Occam and Brandt, sort of capture that in their accounts and in the accounts we have of their perceptions. In Occam's case, we have his own journal diaries, and he talks about confusion. He uses that language a lot. And confusion doesn't mean that he's confused and can't understand the city. Confusion for him is a moral state. And he's particularly shocked at the kinds of inequality that he sees in the city, the disparity between the wealthy and the poor. And this is when we do have the attitudes or the perceptions of indigenous visitors present in the archive. That's a really common theme that people are quite horrified at the amount of inequality that they see in the city. Another theme that comes through is that indigenous visitors are quite shocked at the ecology of the city or very curious about the ecology of the city. How do these people feed themselves? Nobody here can hunt. And that's actually a pretty salient issue throughout London's history is how is it going to feed itself as it grows and grows and grows. And so indigenous visitors like Occam, like Brandt and like others really are able to kind of capture what are the most important problems in urban life and urban growth and actually see those on their own terms which surprised me in a way, I guess, and really was heartening to see that Indigenous people are as astute observers of urban life as anyone else, as Samuel Johnson or you know, European visitors like Casanova and so on. Many Europeans went to North America with the idea that they were going to settle there and establish colonies. And in many cases, establishing colonies meant pushing Native Americans from their lands. So I wonder, did Native Americans ever travel to London with similar ideas? Did they go there with the idea that they might stay and establish their own community or colony? To a large extent, no. It's not like you go to Whitechapel today and that's where you get you know, the best Cherokee food in the world. You know, there aren't these kinds of indigenous enclaves in the city. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I think it has to do with people's connections to their homelands, the marginalization that people experience in the settler colonial states like the U.S., There are a whole host of reasons, I think, for why there aren't those diasporic communities in London. There is one exception to that, though, that today there are several hundred Maori people from New Zealand who live in London and have a really strong sense of community. They call themselves Ngati Nanana, which means the tribe of London. And so there is a significant Maori community there today. 
But there are lots of Indigenous travelers who move through, even in the present, artists, performers, activists, and so on, who come through the city and often are connecting with these deeper histories of Indigenous travelers who came in centuries past. Why do you think it's important for us to recover the stories of Native travelers to London? I mean, what do their visits really reveal about early American history and about the early days of the British Empire? Well, when we think about the nature of empire, there's sort of a triangle that we tend to talk about. The triangle of the metropole, meaning a place like London, the sort of the settler, and then the, quote, native. And scholars, I would say, have really successfully looked at the relationship between settlers and the metropole and between settlers and native people. But very few people have looked at the relationship between native people and the metropole and the center of empire. That's an area of scholarship that's still just starting to open up with books like Jace Weaver's The Red Atlantic, for example. And so people are just now starting to ask this question about what about indigenous peoples outside of traditional territories, indigenous travelers, indigenous cosmopolitans, indigenous whalers, and so on, who are traveling the networks of this growing Atlantic world. What about them? How might that shift our story a little bit? And one of the things that is, I think, really important in that process is that it it moves indigenous people out of kind of a static past and it moves them into the colonial present in ways that I think are really important. This semester, I'm teaching a colonial U.S. history course, and it's really typical, I think, in the way those courses are set up, that Indigenous people appear early in the course, and then they kind of disappear as the course develops toward the American Revolution. And what I've tried to do is really flip that around. And I think this book does something kind of similar to that in the sense that Indigenous people never disappear in this book. There's such a powerful narrative of indigenous disappearance and extinction that we always have to work against in this field. And this book is really an attempt to do that in one of the most extreme situations, and that is being in the center of empire. Speaking of flipping things around, what do you think descendant communities of early native travelers think about the voyages and experiences of their ancestors? Well, a lot of descendant communities do think about these travelers and do see them as ancestors. A good example of this is another Mohegan traveler named Mahomet Wayanaman, who came to London in 1736 and died of smallpox before he could present a land petition to the king. In 2006, the Mohegan tribe unveiled a monument to him in the grounds of Southwark Cathedral and then presented the land petition to the queen. And in fact, she pulled back the rope to unveil this monument. And so it's a really good example. And the people I talked to about this, they talked about 270 years of time just collapsing into a single moment as they sang honor songs coming into the cathedral for this man. Another example, an Inuit baby who was captured in the 1570s and put on display in a tavern in London and then died quite quickly and was buried at St. Olaf Hart Street. In 2013, the Taltan performance artist and scholar Peter Morin and I did a sort of intervention ceremony, I guess you could call it, at that church for the baby. And so for him, the way he expressed it, he said, this baby is one of my ancestors as a traveler to London. And that's a really common pattern that I hear, that people see these people as kind of their ancestors. This summer, I also took a class to London. It was called In Search of Indigenous London, and I brought eight students to the city for two weeks, and most of the students were Indigenous. And for them, they also saw themselves then as part of this longer history of Indigenous travel to the city as we engaged with the places these people had been and went to Pocahontas' grave site and you know, looked at documents from the Four Kings and so on. They really saw themselves as part of a longer genealogy. You just mentioned documents left by the Four Kings, and yet we don't tend to think of Native Americans as leaving behind written historical records. So would you tell us how you went about uncovering and recovering the stories of the early indigenous peoples who voyaged to London? One of the most challenging things with this project, as as it suggests in your question, is trying to find first-person accounts of indigenous travelers. And the first one of those that we see is, again, Samson Ockham in the 1760s, where we have his own journals of his time there. Prior to that, and sometimes after that as well, it's a matter of kind of reading between the lines of a lot of ventriloquism, of words put into the mouths of indigenous people, and just trying to be honest about that in my writing, to say, well, this seems to be what they thought of what they were doing. Sometimes we do have accounts of people talking about after they return home about what they thought about London, and then seeking also to parlay that experience in London into additional kind of social and political capital when they get home really good example of that is the Cherokee leader Ad Galgala, who comes to London in the 1730s and then uses that to kind of increase his clout back home when he returns. 
But in general, it is a real challenge to get at first-person voices. And so it's a matter of reading between the lines. But we can see lots of clues. So, for example, the agreements that the four kings signed when they were in London in 1710 include at the bottom, they don't include signatures in English, they include their clan totems. So two wolves, a bear, and a turtle. And that really, to me, speaks to there are indigenous political systems, ideas, and so on that are being brought into London, and London is being kind of incorporated into these worldviews. So it's a really challenging process to do this writing, but it involves a lot of creativity and also listening to indigenous scholars who are talking about these systems of belief and political systems and so on and building off of their work to try to inflect the story. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Native Americans had never traveled to Europe? How would relations and diplomacy between Native Americans and Europeans have been different during the 17th and 18th centuries? It's a really, really hard question to answer. My guess is there would probably be significantly more violence, although that's hard to imagine given how violent the 17th and 18th centuries are in North America. But there is a piece, I think, as I think about it, in which these indigenous visitors to London put faces on the kind of nameless, quote, savage that's in the minds of many Europeans. And I think Londoners are quite surprised at the sophistication, at the comportment, and so on of these indigenous travelers, to the extent that sometimes they become kind of celebrities and nobility in their own right. So I can't help but think that that would have mitigated against some of the violence. But again, it's already so violent that it's hard to imagine it being even more so. So it's a really hard question to answer, but it's definitely one worth thinking about. Cole? What aspect of history are you researching now that you've finished recovering the story of Native voyagers to London? Well, I'm changing gears entirely. My training is actually not in the early modern period or even in the Atlantic world. My training is in the 19th and 20th century American West. And so I'm returning back to that. I'm working on a book, just starting it, that's a meditation on landscape and historical trauma set in my hometown, which is called Auburn, Washington, about an hour from Seattle. And it's about four terrible things that happened there. So a treaty war in the 1850s, the destruction of a river, the Japanese internment, and the U.S.'s largest serial killer case, the Green River Killer, and how those stories are remembered or silenced and how they leave clues in the landscape. And then the book's going to be called Slaughter Town because the town's original name was Slaughter. And I'm using that as kind of an operative metaphor, but it's really about the violences at the core of American history and how those leave clues in the landscape around us and how we live with those on a daily basis. It's also going to partially be a memoir about growing up in that place and about my own family's journey westward across the continent to that place. Do you have a place on the internet where we can find more information about you and how we can contact you if we have any questions about Indigenous London? Well, you can go to our department's website, which is www.history.ubc.ca, and you can find my faculty page there, which has more descriptions of some of my other work, including my first book called Native Seattle, and a book I did on ghosts and hauntings. And it gives a little bit of a sense of that Slaughter Town project. And I'm more than happy to hear from people, and I'm really curious to see what people think of the book. It's been sort of a labor of love over the last decade, and I'm really excited that it's out, and I really appreciate opportunities like this to talk about it. Cole Thrush. Thank you for helping us explore the ideas and experiences of Native American travelers in London. Great, thank you. The history of Native American peoples in London is not a hidden history, but it is a long one. It's a history that starts in the early 1500s when Native Americans started visiting England for a whole host of reasons. And Londoners, for their part, seem to welcome this steady stream of Native American voyagers into their city because these travelers gave them a human face to put on the far-flung places that they read about in this growing place called the British Empire. The Native Americans who visited London proved to be smart and savvy. They were astute observers of people and life in London, and as such, they knew what Londoners expected of them, and they acted accordingly. So, if it seemed like playing into Londoners' ideas of Native Americans as noble savages would further their goals, then they played into those ideas. And if it seemed like they had an opportunity to educate Londoners about their people, beliefs, and land, well, they did that too. And this, as Cole points out, 
is how Native Americans helped London and Londoners learn how to become colonial. Londoners needed to understand what the British Empire was and who it encompassed, and Native American travelers were a visual and active part of this education. Now, as Cole reminds us, it's important to remember that early America was a violent place. Empire and colonization are about power, exploitation, and violence. These are ideas we've discussed in other episodes and have seen by how colonists seized land, exported trees and other natural resources to England and abroad, and how everyone living in North America experienced and lived through five wars for empire between 1689 and 1783, and all the other wars that took place in between those wars, mostly between Native Americans and colonists. Which brings us to the most important point of our exploration. Native Americans were not bystanders or supporting actors in early American history or in the early history of the British Empire. They've always been main actors who are central to these histories. And as Cole noted, this is a fact that we can see clearly when we explore how some Native Americans went to London and interacted with people and politicians at the heart of the empire. Look for more information about Cole, his book, Indigenous London, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 132. The Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture made this episode possible, so please support them in return by taking a look at this great organization and the William & Mary Quarterly. The William & Mary Quarterly is the leading journal of early American history, and it's a journal with history I know you'll love because you're already familiar with some of the history that has appeared in its pages. Portions of many of the books that have been discussed on this podcast appeared first in the William & Mary Quarterly. For more information about the Omohundro Institute and the William & Mary Quarterly, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash WMQ. Finally, does knowing that Native Americans interacted with Europeans in Europe change how you view and think about early American history? If so, I'd love to know how. Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.